Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight we learn why humans are the scariest of monsters. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. When I was 17, I moved to college two hours away from home and took residence in the dorms on campus. The dorms were not run through the school, but through a management company. There were a lot of safety problems in the dorms, and as a result of this, assaults, overdoses, drugs, and shootings were commonplace. Some even occurred right outside. I am an 100 pound female, so I always watched out for serious situations around me. Everything was great. I had some awful roommates, but I was mostly left alone. One day in September, I was leaving for class early in the morning when I spotted a condom taped to my name tag on the door. It was just a note that said, call me XOXO with some random phone number. I told the RA and nothing came of it. I just thought it was some random prank pulled by one of the other guys on the floor. Things went south with my roommates, mostly because of my night terrors, scaring them, even though I warned them before that we even agreed to be roommates. So I was moved into a two bedroom door with my new roommates. We each had our own room. And after about a week of living there, I started noticing that things were appearing in the living room while we were asleep. I asked Jay about it, and she absolutely denied it was her. One day, we noticed that the lock on the front door did not close properly. If you pulled on the lock and twisted the handle at the same time, the door would come open. Around the time, I started getting Snapchat messages of inappropriate things vague threats, as well as offers for great sex. I would get ones that would say things like, you look great today, with the specific article of clothing that I was wearing. I filed a report to the dorms to have them fix the locks, but it took them four months and eight complaints and threats of legal action and my friend D yelling at them in order for anything to happen. We finally got our doors fixed, but the presence still appeared outside of the door with notes for me. I was still receiving Snapchats, but I moved out of the dorms into an apartment with my then boyfriend. The Snapchats continued. Then I started getting calls at my work. I worked for the Dean's office of my college, and I was in charge of answering the phones. Daily, I would get three or more calls from randomly generated numbers, and I discovered it was through apps like Viber and Skype. After I reported it to the police, and they investigated it. I would answer the phone. This is Francesca. How may I help you? and I would hear some heavy breathing for a few seconds, and then they would just hang up. I thought it was just some 12 year old pranking our office until my co-worker got a call. She answered with her name and the person on the line asked if they could speak to me. Thinking it was one of the deans that I had been working with, she forwarded it to my phone. I answered it and received the same heavy breathing until they hung up. I reported it to my boss. She did nothing. One of the deans overheard the conversation 
and reported it to Title IX. Oh boy. Talking with them was a mistake. After the meeting with them, the threat started getting worse, and this person found my new apartment. And one day in December, I was dog-sitting two wonderful dogs, who hated other dogs and would bark at them on sight. It was around 11pm, and I decided to take them out before bed. We get outside. To the right is a bunch of thick trees that are hard to see through. And I start to take these girls to the grass on the left, and they begin growling and barking at something in the trees. I assume it's another dog, and I try to pull them away, but they will not budge. I glance over, and I can make out that in the trees there is a tall man. But the weird thing is, he is wearing a Michael Myers-like mask. He starts rushing towards me. The dogs get between me and him. He stops. I run up the stairs behind me into the apartment as he is disappearing into the trees again. Stupidly, I did not call the police. But I see him one more time before I move to my new apartment. Things are quiet for a while. My boyfriend and I break up, and I spend the first few days in the new apartment alone. I come to find out the windows can be accessed from the ground, and that they don't lock. One morning, I wake up, and everything seems normal. So I check the mirror to do my hair for work, and I discover that I have a bald spot. My head was shaved in the middle of the night. I find my hair tied up in knots in an envelope, and I immediately call the police. They do an investigation, and find the window was broken, but can't find anything to figure out who it was that came into my apartment. They ask me to compile a list of everything that was missing, and the only thing gone other than my hair were three pairs of dirty underwear. I have photos of the hair and bald spot, which I had to submit to the police. An investigation which found no one. I have since moved, and I no longer answer my phone at work, and I keep bear spraying next to my bed at all times. I made the mistake of picking up a stranger late at night. I know, I know. I'm the biggest idiot in the world. I've done it a few other times though, typically at night, and people usually appreciate it. One time, it ended up being my friend from school. Another time it was a kid stumbling home drunk, in the days before Uber. So I always had pleasant experiences with it. Until tonight. I've always had a soft spot for people walking alone at night. I know I should be wary of them, but I can't help but feel sorry for them. I know it must be creepy to walk by yourself in the dark. And on top of that, my sister's best friend was actually hit by a car and killed one night when she was on a walk. My sister was actually walking next to her friend when she was hit, and by some miracle, the car only hit her friend, and not her. I always thought of how lucky I was that my sister survived. So that brings us back to tonight. I was driving home from the movie theatre after seeing the movie Hereditary, which I would highly recommend, by the way. 9 out of 10. I was driving down this windy, narrow, and dark road near my house, when all of a sudden, I see a person, who I presume is a young woman slash teenager, walking down the road. This frightened me, because I had just seen a scary movie. It was 11pm on a Sunday, and she was wearing dark clothes, 
and I couldn't see her until I was literally passing her. I turned around at the nearest street and drove back towards her. I considered all the possibilities. Maybe she'd had an argument with her boyfriend. Maybe she was having issues with her family. I would have just chalked it off as a person taking a nightly walk. Had it not been on this particular street. I live in a very small safe town and most streets have sidewalks. This street has very few houses and is not a street someone would typically walk down. I figured that if she was walking down this street, it wasn't a planned nightly stroll. I pull over and it's a young woman who's probably in her late twenties slash early thirties. For reference, I'm a five foot five, 22 year old woman and I drive a dinky Toyota Kami, which has car seats in the back since I'm a nanny. So I figure I'm about as trustworthy looking as they come. She doesn't react when I pull up. Then I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Olivia. Do you need some help? Can I give you a ride somewhere? And she doesn't respond. She was kind of talking to herself and didn't really answer me at first. I thought she may have just been shaken up by something. So I didn't really register why she wasn't answering. So I start to leave since she hasn't answered me and she comes with me to my car and I say, Oh great. Where to? To which she ignores me again. At this point, I don't really know what to do. So I start driving in the direction she was walking. I start to ask her if I should be turning down any of the side streets, which she ignores and continues talking to herself. We eventually get to the end of the road. So I make a turn onto another road and park in the parking lot of a local pond. At this point, I'm thinking that she's taken some sort of drug. Every once in a while, I could make out a few words. And she kept talking about how bad people were coming to get her. I asked her if she'd taken anything and needs to go to the hospital. And she was very offended when I asked that and just scoffs. I then ask her, do you maybe need some food and water? I know there's a 24 hour diner around here. To which she replies, ha, food and water. You're funny. You're with them, aren't you? You've set me up. They're coming here, aren't they? She's frantically looking up and down the street at every car that passes. I realize I'm making her nervous and I can tell her I can drop her off anywhere or call someone for her or do anything to make her feel safe. Every once in a while, she would start crying for a bit and kept talking about the bad people that were coming for her. I also suggested that we could go to the police so she would have somewhere safe to go. She scoffs at the idea as well. And after sitting with her for over 30 minutes, waiting for her to give me some sort of direction, I get a call from my mom. Hey, I'm on my way home. I'm stuck in some crazy late traffic. Oh, okay. See you in a bit. Now I can be a good liar when I want to be. I knew this one wasn't convincing though. And I knew my mom could tell something was up. When my phone rang, the woman's eyes darted towards me. And after I hung up, she started convincing herself that I was setting her up. I know this sounds selfish, but at this point, I didn't even care about the woman much anymore. I started to get scared for my own safety. She had this big handbag and she held it to her chest the whole time. I started to worry that maybe she had a gun or perhaps a different kind of weapon with her. By this point, 
We had been sitting in the Pond parking lot for over 45 minutes. At the worst time possible, my cousin starts texting me about coming out to her parents. The woman would get very anxious when I would start texting. So I kept updating her and showing her my phone to show her that I'm not texting any of the bad people that she is afraid of. In fact, I'm texting my cousin and saying congrats for coming out. When she couldn't see what I was doing on my phone, she'd get very nervous and start talking to herself and wind herself up. I figured for my own safety, I needed to keep her at least suspicious as possible. I realised that I needed help. I couldn't call anyone because when my mum called, the woman darted her eyes towards me and held her stare the entire phone call. I was worried that she would actually try to kill me if I called anyone. So I start pretending to text my cousin again about coming out. In reality, I start texting my mum saying, don't call me back. Call the cops and tell them to come to Elk Pond. I'm safe, but please don't call me and don't come here. Meanwhile, I'm pretending to be texting my cousin and telling the woman, oh, her parents took her coming out really well. She also went to the LA Gay Pride last year and was so bummed to be missing it this year. Every time a car drove by, she would start slowly freaking out and accuse me of setting her up again. Finally, a few minutes after I text my mum, two cop cars poured into the pond parking lot. The woman gave me the most evil stare I have ever witnessed, and the cops pull up and ask me to get out of the car. I'm relieved by this, and gladly tell the cop exactly what happened. The other cop just goes up to my passenger window and sees the woman, and says to the other, Oh, it's just Amanda. The cop fills me in on this woman. Basically, she wanders the streets in town constantly, usually in residential neighbourhoods or around schools, and gets the cops called on her very frequently. I told the cops that I didn't know if I should take her to the hospital in case she was mentally ill, or if she was high or on something, and they basically told me that both of my suspicions were right. While this was not a fun lesson to learn. It was certainly a valuable one. When I got home, my mum rushed out of the house and embraced me. I had given this poor woman the scare of her life, all because I was too naive and trusted a stranger. So kids, adults, and anyone in between, learn from me. Do not pick up a random stranger. Call your local police station if you see someone walking at night. They will most likely be the ones who will be able to assist them best. And you won't be putting yourself at risk. A current harmless admirer just messaged me after a few months. And it got me thinking about my first and hopefully last legit stalker. This was years ago. I was probably grade 10 or 11. And so at last I had gotten my learner's provision and was learning to drive. I fancied myself an amateur photographer. So I was off by a creek one day, taking pictures of ducks and whatnot. When a guy wanders up to me and begins asking me questions about my camera, he looked to be only about a year older than me, but I could tell he was younger brain-wise, and I was more happy to tell him about my fancy new DSLR. The creek was near a bridge by my house, and as me and the dude were talking, my mum drives by and spots me. She tells me she's going to the corner store for snacks and asks if I wanted to get some driving practice in. To which I say yes, 
and hop into the front seat and the dude gets in the back. What? My mum thinks he's a buddy since he doesn't look much older. So says nothing and casually chats with him as we drive. When we get to the store, he goes off a few aisles to get chips and I tell my mum, I have no idea who that guy is. We aren't sure if he's violent or not. So my mum takes over driving. He hops into the car and she tells him that she's going to drive him back to his house. He replies, no, I'll go wherever you guys go. What? She makes up some lie about going to a family gathering out of town and drops him off where she found him. Our house was nearby. So she takes off in the opposite direction and we drive around for about half an hour so that he doesn't know where we live. When we come back, he's nowhere to be found. And so we go home and assume that that ordeal was over. Fast forward a few days later, we are on our porch doing porch things. And I spot a guy standing at the end of the street. It's too far to see if it's the dude. But I mention it to my mum and we go inside. A week later, same deal. We don't call the cops because we just can't tell, but we have a feeling. He's just standing there at the intersection, just watching. Fast forward a week or two later and I'm still at work. I get a call from my mother. Apparently the dude rang the bell and asked my grandmother if I was home. My grandmother, slightly ailed with early onset dementia, totally forgot about Creeper and says no, that I'm at work, accidentally confirming that I live there. And he asks where I work and thanks to that early onset dementia, she forgot the name but tells him a restaurant in the mall. Oh shit. So I'm freaked out telling my co-workers this story. One line cook grabs a newspaper and shows me the most wanted list. The dude is there for violation of probation. And the line cook says her husband went to jail with him for a bit and that he's supposedly nonviolent and was in for fraud or something. But to be careful, and to get escorted to my car after work. We show the picture around to staff and they decide it's best for me to work in the kitchen that day as my normal grill station is literally two feet from the door. Not even an hour goes by and the dude comes in asking for me. Now keep in mind, my grandmother didn't know where I worked so he must have went around to every restaurant in the mall. Mine was tucked in a corner of a department store that normally only old people shop at. So I'm amazed that he even knew that it was there. Most people told me that place doesn't have a restaurant. You must be mistaken. Whenever I told them where I worked, so it was pretty hidden to those who were 65 and younger. My co-worker tells him that there's nobody there by my name and he gets kind of irate and insists I have to work there. I must have been the last one he checked. My manager hears the kerfuffle and comes out threatening security and whatnot. He leaves and I immediately call the Crime Stoppers number. He stopped by my house once more that day before I was off shift. And then I never saw or heard from him again. I still don't know if he gave up or they caught him. I only told Crime Stoppers that he had told me he lived in the area with his grandmother. So maybe that was enough info. But nonetheless, I'm very glad that we did not meet again. I've pushed this from my mind in the past couple of months because any activity has seemingly stopped. And yet somehow I knew 
This silence was too good to be true. And eventually, we would hear from him again sooner or later. It all started a few months ago. A guy messaged me on Facebook. And unlike the usual creepy messages I get, this one sounded intelligent and funny. We started chatting from time to time, talking about anything and everything. He said he was divorced with one child, and I empathised every time he would complain about his ex-wife. Even though, it also kind of bothered me that he would tell me all those personal details to a virtual stranger. After all, no matter what happened between them, she was still the mother of his child. So have some respect. We continue chatting and I'm getting more relaxed. We are at the stage where we often discuss our daily lives and inevitably, I talk about my best friend with whom I am extremely close to. We are like sisters. At that particular time, she'd been very busy with changes happening at her work and some issues with a guy she met, but said things are complicated and she would explain in details when there is more time to meet. Now keep in mind that under normal circumstances I would have known every little detail about that. But as it happened then, there wasn't sufficient time to properly see each other and talk. So I only knew the basics. No names, no pictures. I'm talking to Mr. Guy. Jake, and I start taking note that every time we do, he would casually direct the conversation towards my best friend, Jenna. I have mentioned to him that we have known each other since we were babies, practically grew up together, and he would always ask me to tell him funny stories from our childhood and teen years, and then proceeded asking about who she was with now, and what kind of guys she liked. I would jokingly ask if he got tired of me and wanted her number, but he would deflect it with an awkward humour, so I didn't really think anything past that. Some time had passed, and things were a bit calmer at Jenna's work, so we were finally able to meet for drinks. Inevitably, we start discussing Jake, and I tell her about him, and she is smiling and nodding, until I take my phone out and show her a picture, and she goes pale in the face. She grabs my phone and says, This is him? This is the guy I told you about? At first I presume she is joking, as she's prone to messing with me, but she looks dead serious. So I start asking questions. Turns out, she met him on a dating app. They talked first and she was under the same impression. That he was smart, charming and cultured. So when he eventually asked her out, she gladly accepted. They went out, had drinks, talked and everything was fine. Until by the end of the evening, he got a little too grabby and insistent for more than a goodnight kiss. He insisted to drive her home, even though she had her own car there, and suggested that he could pick it up with her in the morning. Since she didn't want him to know where she lived, she was annoyed at his advances and refused and managed to escape him somehow. She told me that she was afraid he would follow her home. So instead she went to a bar where a friend of hers worked after that. The next day he called and apologised for his behaviour at the end of the evening and blamed the drinks and the stress at his work and then told her he had to admit something to her because he really liked her and wanted to be honest with her. She agreed and they met again. When he admitted that he was actually in the process of getting a divorce, but hadn't yet filed for it, 
and that he was still living with his wife and small child because she didn't have a job and he couldn't just leave her alone tending for their child before she was financially stable. Jenna, being the blunt gal she is, and called bullshit at his story and accused him of being yet another married man out to cheat and using false excuses for sympathy. The guy worked as a sales rep so he was really smooth and convincing. So I don't know, but he managed to appease her doubts, at least to the point of not cutting him off right there and then. Some time passes, and he chats to her online, calls her, and they talk. But she tells him that the only way that she would ever consider getting intimate with him would be if she sees proof that he is actually divorced and living separate from his family. One day, he calls her and tells her that he will put his wife on the phone to prove to her that even though they live together, they sleep in separate rooms and are technically separated. A woman's voice really confirms that, but it leaves Jenna more puzzled than reassured. She is conflicted, because despite everything, she actually likes the guy and is therefore worried to not get herself into a mess if she falls deeper. She is still hesitant to accept his invitations to meet. So one day, he, accidentally, walks past the place she works at, at exactly the time she finished work. What are the odds, right? And she agrees to grab a drink, as long as they talk and act platonic. And apparently, that is also when she tells him about her life now, and her childhood, and where I am brought into the conversation. He listens attentively, and afterwards, when she and I compared timelines, it turned out exactly a few days after that guy started messaging me on Facebook. We are both livid and incredulous. So we decided to confront him separately, and then compare notes. When I get back home, I text him asking him why he lied to me that he was divorced, when he is clearly still living with his family, and, more importantly, why he started talking to me when he was already seeing my best friend. He was unprepared for that, but he bounced back quickly and gave me some bullshit explanation. How he was curious about me when he heard so much from me from Jenna and wanted to see what I was like. So he went through her Facebook friends list and found me. Mind you, she hadn't added him on Facebook. So he basically stalked her profile to gather that information. Just like she didn't exactly tell him where she worked. Yet, he knew where to accidentally walk past on that day. When Jenna confronted him, he told her that he was just curious and wanted to hear from the person that knows her best, her best friend. She told him that it was wrong and creepy on so many levels, but he insisted that he had no bad intentions and that he just liked her so much that curiosity got the better of him. When we compared notes after that, Jenna and I decided to just stop talking to him whatsoever, because the guy is a liar and extremely weird. We tell each other that we don't want to talk or see him again, and even though he is shocked and tries to convince us otherwise, he eventually accepts that and says that if we change our minds, he'll be happy to talk. We think that it's over. At first, he seemed to take it well, but then he would accidentally send you a picture or a message that was intended for someone else, but mistakenly sent it to me or Jenna, just so that he could initiate conversation. He would attempt to ask me or her out again, get refused, and then retreat until the next accidental call or message. Then the random bumping into each other ensued. Whenever we would go out my way to work, at the market, a cafe or at Jenna's gym, 
he would be there. Of course, these are all random encounters. We started to get annoyed more than anything at this point, but still thought he was a lying bastard, but still harmless. So there wasn't much we could do except wait it out, thinking he would eventually move on. Wrong. One day, Jenna comes at my place freaked out, and she tells me that she was on a date with a new guy she met, and she saw Jake passing by the restaurant she was in, and then later he called her in hysterics, screaming at her, Look what you did! I can't get you out of my mind because of you, and I got so angry that I hit my child and chased my wife out of the house into the cold. She got fed up with him, so she told him to never bother her again and to go seek a therapist, because he clearly had issues, and then blocked him. That creeped us out, because not only he wasn't moving on, he seemed to have been escalating and become aggressive. I told her that if he calls again, she should threaten him with the police, and reporting that he was allegedly abusive towards his family. We are in the middle of discussing that when I get a call from an unknown number, and normally I don't pick up on those, but I was waiting for a package to be delivered and thought it might be the courier company. When it was him, he was crying. He was sobbing on the phone and pleading with me to convince Jenna to unblock him, that it wasn't fair and that I needed to help him. He sounded like crazy. I was shocked to hear him in this state. It was such a contrast to his normal, smooth demeanour. So I calmly told him that he should act like a grown-up and calm down, and that it's not my place to convince her about anything after she's made up her mind, especially not after his crazy behaviour and threats about hitting his child and chasing his wife out. He then told me that he didn't really do those things, but wanted to make Jenna feel guilty and scare her into talking to him. So he said that. He started apologising profusely about it, and said that he was at his wit's end and didn't know what to do. I told him that it had gone on long enough. He was a 35-year-old male, so he should act like it. And that, if he ever proceeds contacting or stalking us again, we will go to the police. I hung up and blocked him as well. The police threat seemed to work and we haven't heard from him in about two months. But yesterday, Jenna and I were at a birthday party at a club, and guess who was the birthday girl's plus one? So this is among the scariest things to ever happen to me in my entire life. To start, I'll set the scene. This occurred in Florida about three or four years ago when I was 21 to 22. I'm a small dude, five foot six, but I'm relatively muscular and fit. The city I lived in was a pretty decently big city as far as Florida goes. I'd lived there for about 10 years, so I'd become pretty damn comfortable there. I worked a lot of nights at the time, mostly 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. shifts. I lived on the outskirts of the city at the time, so needless to say, it was less busy and much more low-key. At the time, I was preparing to join the military, so fitness was a big priority, despite the long shifts I was working. I would wake up late, head straight for work, get home, relax, and then run whenever I was ready. This also proved an effective way to dodge the horrible Florida heat and humidity and allowed for a more enjoyable run. So one particular night, I just finished closing up my work, food services, ugh, and was ready to head home after a long last day. I was really into GTA 5 online at the time, so I was dying to get home and play. Due to being off the next day, 
I played for a lot longer than I usually would before my late night run and was almost tempted by my friends to skip it just one time. I eventually felt the guilt overcome me and decided to get up and got to about 2.30 to get this damn run out the way. So as always, I put on my neon green Nike shirt, a reflective armband that holds my phone and my running shoes, which are also reflective. I stretch into my driveway, as always, and I grab my water bottle and start the mile or so walk from my house that I take to get to the back road where I do my run. I arrive, place my water bottle in a bush by the dimly lit church on the corner, and I prepare to start going. Now, during my actual run, I would only use the two primary back roads. I would start running down one road, which was notable for not having anything but trees and fences on either side. Take a right, and then run down this dimly lit road with a few houses, tucked away in the woods for about another mile. I would turn around after that, and after about four miles of running, I would enjoy my cool down walk back home. Anyway. My run begins. The weather is cool and windy, and I'm about a half mile down the empty road, when I hear a car approach from behind me. It passes me at about 40, while seeing a vehicle is somewhat rare in the area at this time of night. The dark Dodge Charger was going about 15 below the speed limit, and doesn't strike me as unusual as there's always a risk of hitting a deer in this part of town. I keep moving, as the car is about a hundred yards away from me. It comes to an immediate halt. This immediately sends shivers down my spine, as there is literally nothing on this road worth stopping for. I stop running, and just patiently watch the car. I squat down near the bushes on the side of the road to lower my profile as I watched. The passenger side door opened, and a tall dark figure stood next to the open door for a few moments, peering in my direction. But I was hidden by the darkness. It occurred to me that my presence might be the reason for the stop, as they may be suspicious of someone running down this road this late. I quickly threw the idea out of my head, as I was very obviously wearing running clothes designed to be seen late at night and would be absurd for anyone to think I was in trouble in my bright ass outfit. Another minute or so, and the passenger got back in the car, and suddenly whipped around and started speeding in my direction. The very instant the vehicle started to whip around, I rolled from my squatting position in the bushes, and stayed as still as possible. The car passed me and came to a halt about 10 to 15 feet in the other direction. I could see them turning their high beams on, and turned back around in the middle of the road, and started to slowly creep down the road at about 5 to 10 miles per hour, and turn their lights off completely. After they passed me once again, I poke my head out just a little to see where they are. The car approaches the turn at the end of the road, and turns right and stops there, only to flash their high beams down the road with the houses. Needless to say, I'm sufficiently creeped out, and hoping it was just an unmarked police officer trying to talk to me. But most police vehicles in my area have spotlights, so searching for me with high beams would make no sense. The car turns around again as I pop myself back into the bush, and proceeds once again to turn the lights off. Then the scariest part. I hear the engine start to rev loudly, and suddenly the charger is shooting down the road near 90 miles an hour, headlights off and all. It whips around and does the same thing again back in the direction of the dark road, and in panic, I get my phone out to call 911. I can't leave the bush without risking getting hit, and I'm honestly mortified. As soon as I get ready to dial, the charger 
turns on the dark road, flashes their high beam in another attempt to find me, and disappears down the road. I climbed out of the bush, and made a break in the other direction, desperately trying to get home. I sprinted down the road faster than I've ever moved in my life, and as I approached the church, I started to feel more safe. So I slowed it to a brisk walk and called 911 to report what happened. I spoke to an operator, who tried to talk to me and tell me to stay put and hidden, as they wouldn't be able to send an officer for another 15 to 20 minutes. I hustle over to the bush to hide, and am still on the phone with the operator when I realise my water bottle is completely gone. This confirms my suspicion that I was being deliberately followed and stalked by whoever was following me, and that they most likely had ill intentions. I stayed until the police arrived, gave my report, and was given a ride home. Needless to say, I started running during the day before work, and never took the back road again.